Want to take a look at a few quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. for the holidays. Obviously, he's one of America's great rhetoricians, both for the message he was providing as well as for the way he was able to provide it. In other words, he's also one of America's great wordsmiths in the way he was able to construct his presentations in a persuasive way and present them in a persuasive way, most likely from training to be a preacher. He was also able to put his arguments in the context of the Constitution, which made them more persuasive as well to the general population. So I just searched on Google, you know, for, for quotes, and I'll just pick out a few of them. I don't think we hear as many of the quotes as much as basically we used to in like the common discord or in the normal media feeds or anything like that. So in any case, first one, quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, end quote. Obviously, this is a really famous line. You used to hear it quoted basically all the time in the media and elsewhere and whatnot. Oftentimes, it wouldn't be adding the first part of it, but you'd also then hear it quoted in the second part, which would be basically framed as uh, judged not by the color of the skin, but by the content of the character. And I see why they put the double C right here. You can see how that would play out in a rhetorical fashion. He's got the two C's, which kind of sound nice, the content of the character. But I think oftentimes when people would repeat it, they'd say, judge not by the color of the skin, but by the content of their heart. And I think heart is a like kind of a more powerful word, even though you don't get that cool, that nice double uh, C sound right there. And then this first part, I think would work quite well, of course, in a speech because you're appealing to a child and everybody's heart's going to go out to a child. I would also think that this is appealing to basically the Constitution, which basically says all men are created equal and saying, hey, you should be in alignment with basically the Constitution, which rings true to basically pretty much anybody in the audience. Next one, quote, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other, end quote. So this is an interesting one as well. It rings true. It sounds quite powerful. He's using a rhetorical device here where he's basically starting the or ending each sentence or each phrase and then starting in the same area, which gives you a feel of basically a logical pro- progression as if these th- two things have to be connected just in that way. So, for example, people fail to get along because they fear each other. And then he starts the next sentence or fragment. They fear each other because they don't know each other. And then he starts the next sentence or fragment. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Notice that that device works really well if it's also basically true, if it's a, if it's a logical progression. But you could use that same kind of thing with something that doesn't even make any sense and it sounds like it logically fits together. For example, if I was to say something like, I went to the store because my cat had a fur ball. My cat had a fur ball because the sun is hot and the sun is hot because water's wet and water's wet because gum is sticky or something like that. There's no logical progression there. But if you if you end the phrase and then start the phrase with the same the same ending, it sounds like it's some logical progression to it. And but again, that 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 won't work if it doesn't have an actual logical progression. So if you say something that has a logical progression and you put it into that format, then, you know, it lends a little bit more power to it, it seems. I think Yoda did something like that, too. He said something like, the Yoda quote was like, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering, right? And you could you could have a different progression there, but it sounds so nice and concise uh, when he says it that way. So in any case, Next one, quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that, end quote. So this is another one. I think it rings true. So that makes it obviously way more powerful if it is actually something that is true. And it's also going to be something that's quite balanced in the way he's presenting it here. So darkness cannot drive out darkness. It's going to basically tie out to or or kind of balance between hate cannot drive out hate. So you've got a, you know, a symmetry there in the, in, the, in the structure. And then you've got this only light can do that balances out to the only love can do that. Just t- changing that one word, keeping everything else the same makes it really symmetrical, which is something to the human ear just sounds really nice. So it says, you know, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So it sounds really balanced. And again, I think that symmetry makes it sound like, 
Well, that's perfectly logical because it's symmetric, it's balanced, and so on, and it rings true. So, so therefore, you know, I think it, you know, powerful way to phrase it. Next one, quote, all we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. Somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of the press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right, end quote. Now, I think this one's really powerful because he knows his audience of Americans and he's appealing to the things that we all have in common. Those are going to be the American type of principles that are outlined in the Constitution, which he refers to here when he says, be true to what you said on paper. So he's basically saying, be true to what your, you know, your founding documents are basically saying here, which are basically based on the idea of natural rights the idea of individual liberties, inalienable rights, you might say. Those are going to be the rights that, of course, are applied to an individual that can't really be taken away by another person or by the government because they're given by nature, or he would most likely argue by God, given the fact that he's a preacher. So he's arguing kind of in alignment, knowing his audience to the founding documents, to the things that we all basically have in common. He's not basically saying... Your found, the founding documents or these principles of individual rights are wrong. I think he believes in the idea of natural law and individual rights. He's saying, you wrote down the right thing here. You're not basically holding up to the thing that you wrote down, which is a completely different argument, I would think, than saying that the, thing, the actual founding principles are wrong. He's saying, no, the founding principles are right. You're not living up to the, the founding principles, which I think is a much more persuasive and power, powerful type of argument. He's also got some rhetoric down here, which down here he says, uh, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. So he's got a nice little double, the right for right, the double meaning of right here. And also note that he didn't really, he didn't really say it explicitly. He didn't say, hey, look, the Constitution says <laughs> all men are created equal, which basically should be interpreted, you know, as everyone should be created equal under the law. In essence, he didn't kind of lay it out and give like a legal case here, he's appealing to the thing that we all have in common without actually naming it, which gives us a sense of solidarity. It's, it's basically saying, I, I don't need, you don't need to tell me what we're talking about. I know what we're talking about because we're all Americans and you don't need to be so explicit. He just basically assumes we know. So when he says here, be true to what you said on paper, he's talking about the Constitution. He's talking about the founding documents. He doesn't need to say it. He, if, he, if he said there, if he said, be true to the Constitution that you wrote down, it wouldn't be as powerful. It's more powerful to kind of allude to the thing that we all know because we're all Americans. And so somewhere I read that the freedom of assembly. So again, he's, he's alluding to these kind of principles that we all know about without actually, you know, saying them explicitly and where they are. Freedom of assembly, I found it in Article 2 or whatever of this document and whatnot. And you're not doing, no, he's not doing, he's not being a lawyer here. He's being, you know, kind of persuasive in his argument. So it's interestingly worded and well worded, I would think.